for joining us tonight on this webinar. It's going to be really exciting to talk to you all about the work I do and how I'm trying to change people's mindsets and how we deal with and overcome wildlife conflicts. Now, I bet everyone listening and um, tuning in tonight, we've probably all come across mice in a house, maybe a rat in a garden or even wasps that annoy us at some point during the year, uh, particularly the end of the summer. But you know what? There is ways you can solve these wildlife conflicts without causing any harm. Now, I've been doing this for quite a few years now. And when I first started, people laughed at me. Even my own family members were laughing at me going, what are you on about? This won't work. It's just not possible. Um, but I had uh, a very, very good mentor, um, a gentleman called John Bryant, who sadly passed away uh, just recently, um, which was devastating to myself. But I have promised um, in his memory and to his wife that I'll carry on the baton to keep pushing forward the work I'm doing because he made the foundations for this work and I wanted to take it further and keep going with it because I think it's very, very important in, um, in today's world. So I'm going to go for a slide uh, show and show you this. And um, if you've got any questions, please uh, pop them in the chat. So um, I've got a chat open here and I can try and answer them as we go or leave them to the end. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Just one moment. Right, okay, so uh, let's get going with this then. So um, thank you to everyone at OneKind for inviting me to do this talk, first of all. Um, they've supported me for many years and also support the amazing work they do. So tonight I'll be talking about overcoming wildlife conflicts, but let's not forget the great work OneKind does also for helping wildlife in Scotland and further afield. So before I start, this is all about helping uh, one kind get some extra funds for their campaigns and that COVID-19 hit all of us hard but if you can donate even just the smallest amount tonight for one kind I think there's going to be a donation link somewhere that you can donate via please do donate because their work is so vital uh, to wildlife and, and they really are uh, just pushing the boundaries and taking things further forward so after that let's crack on with this then so who are we Humane Wildlife Solutions was founded by myself, Kevin Newell, in 2012, uh, with the aim to offer people and businesses a non-lethal, ethical alternative to fentanyl pest control. I'd like to add in there, we're also environmentally friendly. I'm very conscious about the environment, and it's such a big topic right now. Um, you know, with, you know, rebellion movements going, going on all over the country, you know, pushing for better, better question of accountability uh, how we treat our environment and that's something we've done from the get-go we've always been very conscious about our impact on the environment and animals so we don't use anything which is harmful in any way or form to the environment or to the animals we work with not only do we offer our services for wildlife conflicts but a lot of people don't know we do a lot of our own research into new and inventive ways of overcoming wildlife conflicts so we've done research into looking at trying to find a way we can use natural plant compounds, for example, to repel wasps and their nests. Now, I'll go into this a bit more later on. We had some really exciting um, results come out of this research we did. Didn't go the way I thought it would do, but we got a lot of interest um, by some big research companies who wanted to invest in this. Um, like I said, I'll go into that more later on, but then other kind of things we do. Also, I love doing educational talks. So I like to try and educate people about wildlife conflicts they're having. So when I, when I get a call come in, and let's say someone's saying, I've got foxes in the garden, terrified for the children, terrified for my cat, I will work with them through all their concerns and their worries and educate them about why the fox is there, what they can expect, how long they can expect it for. And you know, I talk myself out of so many jobs. And to me, if I can convince someone that wildlife conflict is not a conflict and, an, and is an opportunity to appreciate and watch this wildlife that they're coming into conflict with, um, 
and I don't get paid for doing that, but if I can achieve that, then to me, that's the best result I can ever hope for. I, I didn't set this business up uh, as a money-making organization. I did it because of my passion for wildlife. And I wanted people to have a second thought about if they're unhappy with wildlife and there's a conflict going on and what really is going on and how they can, how they can deal with it without harming that animal. So we don't just help people, uh, individuals, we help businesses too. And you know, we've worked from doing movie studios to doing the Commonwealth Games Athletes Village. So we've gone from everything from a little corner shop to massive buildings and businesses, art studios uh, and tenements. And it's, it's great because no job's ever the same. So I'm always having to put my expertise into practice to find a solution. So we were founded in Scotland. I have a very, very proud Scottish business. I know I've not got a Scottish accent. I've been living up here nearly 18 years, I'm originally from Essex, um, but I feel Scottish uh, and it's a country that I truly love. And it's wildlife I truly, truly love. It's just an incredible part of the world to live in and I appreciate it every day. As a business, we have very, very strong ethics and these are that we're non-lethal, that we're ethical, we're environmentally friendly, and we're vegan. And these are all my own personal values that I've inflicted on my business. And it runs strictly by all of these. I'll never do a job where it will compromise any of them and I will never compromise these ethics. So I'm always gonna stand by them. And these ethics are reflected in all the work that I do. So, as a little sideline uh, and spin tonight, I'm going to be doing uh, a wildlife quiz. So I just want to add some fun to this session and hopefully educate you a little bit as well. Um, over the period of the lockdown, I needed to find a way to keep people who support my business engaged. So over the last eight weeks or so, I ran a daily wildlife puzzle over social media, which proved really, really popular. And this resulted in me doing things like you can see here. So you can see these little images, but just tiny, tiny zoomed in clips of images. And what I would do, I'd post these online and I wanted people to guess what the species was. And then the next day I'd reveal what they were. Uh, and it's just a way to kind of educate people and get people back, reconnected back to nature again, because I love nature, I love working with nature, and I wanted to share these amazing images and photos that I took of wildlife. So, for you tonight, there's four different pictures here. Um, you can probably see the one at the top, and this one, and this one, and this one. So, in the chat, I want you to put down your four guesses of what these creatures are. They can all be found in Scotland. In fact, all of these were photographed in Scotland, and um, so, We'll run this quiz through uh, the presentation and before I finish, I will reveal the answers. So I'll let you have a few more seconds to look at these images, have a little guess what you think they could be and then note them down in the chat what you think these four creatures are. Like I said, they're all found in Scotland and they're all absolutely incredible creatures. So overcoming wildlife conflicts. Most of us has had wildlife conflicts in our lives. It could be from mice in our home, wasps nesting in our shed, or good old ratty foraging in our gardens. Sadly, the go-to response to most people in these situations is to kill them. But no one ever needs to take this approach. There is a different way, and it's the way that I work all year round, and will always continue to promote this kind of work. There are many effective ways to solve these potential conflicts without harm, without poison, and most importantly, without killing. So, how is it done? I'm gonna run through a few different examples of how I would work with different species. And just take into mind, every job I do is always very different. I've never had a job in all these years, and I think I've had over 2,000 recorded jobs now um, that I've done <laughs> across the globe, uh, and none of them's ever been the same. I've never had one which was exactly the same, even if I'm doing a uh, block of four, four flats, and they've all got mice, and I'm doing all four properties. Each one of those properties were never the same problem. It's, it's, it's weird, but it's, 
it, it shows how complex this work I do is and how I'll need to find a solution to each of these problems all the time. So we'll start with wasps. Now, I love wasps. I think they're such an incredible species. I, I love them so dearly. I could watch them all day. Sadly, a lot of people don't give them even one second before they're trying to swap them away if they're getting too close. But they're really, really important species in the ecosystem, not just in your garden, but in our towns and our countryside. They are such amazing little builders and they'll build these incredible colonies. And if you've ever looked inside an old wasp nest, the way I describe it, if anyone's ever watched Lord of the Rings, I think it's the Fellowship, when they all go down into the, the Dwarven Mines and they've got these massive pillars that's going through their, the Dwarven Halls, it reminds me of a wasp nest because all these pillars are almost to the exact identical opposite to each other. So the way that they're built is like this, so that the Queen builds them as the workers and they fit perfectly for the Queen to squeeze through all these different pillars, but they're also there to hold open the nest. Now you can see the picture at the bottom here um, is of a queen wasp and a few new workers and a few nursery uh, wasps. And this was a nest that I, I removed. Now when working with wasps, there's a key thing I need to do. And that is I need to find the queen because without the queen and the workers and the nest and all the larvae, I can't reset them. Now I don't harm wasps. My aim with any wasp nest or bumblebee nest is to capture the nest and relocate it so it can continue. It can be a tough job and I've got stung so, so many times, um, but that's in the first few years. In the last four years, I've not been stung once. And I developed how I worked with them to an extent that I understand their behaviors. And that's just how I do all my jobs. I understand the psychology, the behavior, the traits, what the species like, what they don't like. And I, I use that so I can work with them better. So with wasps, I've got to the stage now, I can pick a whole nest up with all the wasps in, put it in a sealed container, take it away and reset it again, usually without a single wasp leaving that nest. Now I'm not gonna give away all my trade secrets here, um, but it's something that I've, I've learned by studying these animals and it just, I love them. So if you don't like wasps, um, Chris Packham did a really, really uh, good piece on BBC Spring Watch. I'd recommend watching that. It's on their Facebook channel. And uh, I love how much he loves those wasps. And he really makes people think differently about them in that video. And just remember, if, if you've got a garden and you're a keen gardener, wasps are your friends. They will take all those pests that you don't want there. You may not enjoy them so much because you're worried they're going to sting you. But if you're not harming them, they're just going to continue normally. So another species that I work with a lot is mice. Now, mice get in a lot of buildings into very, very small gaps. They can squeeze through a gap probably about the end of a pen. You know, they don't need much to, to squeeze themselves through. So working with mice, you need to understand what's bringing them in, how they're getting in, and when they're in the property, where they're going. So with all my jobs, I, if I go to a property, be it a commercial or someone's house, I do what I call my CSI investigation. It literally is a fingertip search of the entire property. Because before I can try and do any proofing or preventative measures, I need to understand what the animal's doing. So I want to know, how's the mouse getting in? What food is he after? What food is he like? Where is he going? Where's his little places he likes to hide? Is it under a sofa, behind a fridge? I need to understand all this. And then I need to find a way to stop him coming back into that property. So for example, I did a commercial premises in a massive shopping mall in Glasgow. They had a mouse problem for six years before I came on the scene. And every one of their neighbors in the shopping mall also had a mouse problem. So we were called out to see if we could solve it. Uh, it took me one visit to solve the problem. I did one visit and I done my CSI investigation. I went from top to bottom and I found their entry point. It was simple as finding this key entry point and sealing it up. I had to ask them to make a few changes because you'll find that, especially with mice and rats, it's usually my clients who sometimes need to change their behavior to help me solve their problem. But in this case, it was mainly finding their entry point. Now I was okay sealing up this entry point because I know the mice are throughout this entire shopping center and they were coming out of the hole and coming into the client's property. 
Since I've done that premises, it was nearly four years ago, they have not had any mice again since. Now, this was a great example of not having to kill or harm an animal to solve a wildlife con conflict. And I do this for all the species I work with all the time. Now, these are just two examples of how you can overcome wildlife con conflicts, be it in your home, be it in a business, without having to use horrible things like poisons or glue traps or kill traps. They're not needed. Um, I have many, many clients who can speak up for us and, and give us testimonies on the work we do and how it helps them. So next time you have a wildlife conflict in your house, in your workplace, in your garden, get in touch because I'll find you a solution uh, to overcome it without harming them. So why pest control needs to change? For decades now, pests, you know, for decades now, poisoning wildlife or killing it in traps and to try and solve a water conflict has accounted for millions of wildlife taken. Now, when I say this, it's not just rats and mice and wasps. There's so many other species which fall victim to pest control methods. Now, I've seen red squirrels and hedgehogs and cats and even dogs come victims of the conventional pest control. And now this needs to change. And um, I don't know how to make it change. I wish I did. If anyone wants to start a campaign with us, maybe we'll run kind to try and do this. I'm, I'm open to office. I'm always willing to start a campaign and try and make the world a better place. Killing this many creatures a year in this way, you would think the industry would have solved most problems by now. But this is not the case. These old conventional pest control methods continue to be used and continue to fall short of a solution to wildlife problems. Old methods have not changed much over the decades, and we think the current methods just do not work. In some places in the country, this is mainly down in the southeast of England, there's such a high resistance to poisons now that the pest control industry themselves think up to 90% of rats and mice in certain parts of London and the southeast are immune now or resistant to the highest dosage of poisons they can use. Now this shows you, if they've been using poisons long enough for a species to develop a resistance to it, one, they're not doing a very good job. Uh, and two, it's shown that poisons are not the way forward. Because if the poisons are not killing these creatures, they just no longer need to be used. They need to think of a different way. Sadly, these companies know they make a lot of money by using poisons. It is a multi-billion pound industry. And they're not really open to too much change because if they did it my way where we do preventative and proofing methods you know you don't get a repeat business and i don't mind that because if i go to a, a property and i do my work and i solve their problem and now they're rodent free or wildlife conflict free for the rest of their time that you know i've done my job that business doesn't have to worry about their stock being damaged or reputation being damaged by mice or rats running around Sadly, other pest controls will come out month after month to keep refilling bait, which doesn't seem to be doing the, the, the trick. So refilling bait stations is not solving the problems, it's simply treating the symptoms of the problem. So a really good example of this is I spoke to a supermarket manager in Scotland and uh, I was talking to someone about my methods and he asked me to come and have a look at his property. Now, what was going on here, they had rats in the back part of the supermarket where they stored all the food. So they had the bait boxes and the rats would come in and they would eat the bait in the bait boxes. And when they'd finished that, they'd move on to the stock. Now, six months after this continuing dance being played out every week, the, the, the supermarket manager could not understand why he was still getting rats. The rats would eat all the poison, which showing the poison's not being effective and then go on to eat his stock. So I went on site and had a look and I said to him, well, you do realize there's a huge hole in your air vent there and your rats are coming in there, uh, which he didn't know. And he was surprised that the pest controller hadn't noticed this and rectified it. Now, they might not have done, but my theory here is the pest controller was onto a very good contract, getting repeat business every week, every month. Why would he, why would he stop that? He needs to make his living. And fair enough, he needs, to support his family and, and what he does. But I said to the supermarket manager, if he sealed that up, you wouldn't need to have a bait, 
uh, station within the supermarket refilled so often. The reason why is because they can no longer get him. He took my advice and it changed the way uh, he dealt with pest control. In fact, it saved all his stock because he wasn't getting rats coming in anymore. And it's little changes like that, little things like that that we recommend. And like, like I said earlier, I don't mind doing a job and completing that job and I don't need to do it again. I'm not in it for the repeat business. I'm not in it for the money. I'm not a very wealthy person, despite I could be with some of the some of the offers I've had in the time I've been doing this business. I'm all about helping wildlife. I'm all about my passion to make the world a better place for our wildlife. And I'm all about educating people so we, as a community, as a country, can find a better solution to wildlife conflicts. So I mentioned before about non-target uh, species, non-target victims, and these are from bait stations or glue traps. Um, so I'm going to run through a few stories in a moment of the ones that stand out for me doing this, uh, the ones which upset me a lot and drives me on to try and do better, drives me on to educate more people and you know just get more people aware of what these these poisons really do. It's not only the intended victims of pest control that die. Sadly, many non-target species are killed, be it directly or indirectly. Now, shrews and voles. Now, when you get outside bait stations, shrews and voles will often go into these and eat the poison too. Pest control companies are meant to do a um, survey, a monitoring of what species are found outside before they put bait stations down. They don't. And shrews and voles, if they're found in these, these surveys, they're not allowed to put poison down. Sadly, a lot of shrews and voles do die through poison. I've seen many, many accounts. I've seen studies done in the Netherlands where they actually studied non-target species victims. And it was shocking to see how many different species were being poisoned and dying, even though the, the initial target was rats and mice. And this actually did include hedgehogs in this one. Now, other non-target species, like birds and hedgehogs, I've seen stuck in glue traps. Now, I don't know if anyone knows what a glue trap is. It's basically a sheet, almost like the same size of a piece of paper, um, sometimes about half the size of that, and it has sticky glue on it. So an animal walks on top of it and it is stuck. It doesn't kill the animal. That animal has to stay there and struggle and suffer until it is put out of its misery by the person who laid that glue trap. Now I've seen supermarkets using this in store, catching birds and mice which are struggling on their shop floors. I've seen a kitten stuck on one of these glue traps. Um, and you know, I've seen birds and even a hedgehog in the study that I saw in the Netherlands, there was a hedgehog stuck on a glue trap. And it, these are horrific things. And it's something that we're looking at, maybe trying to start again a campaign to try and get Scotland as a country, because we seem to be very progressive when it comes to wildlife, to maybe try and ban the sale of glue traps, because I hate them. Uh, there's no excuse for using them. And I've actually changed suppliers a couple of times because I found out they were stocking them. Uh, I had a big argument in Edinburgh once with one of my suppliers in his shop because he was selling them. And he was happy to show me his new um, stock that it was, and it was his glue traps. And thank goodness he actually stopped because I made such a fuss. And it, Maybe a small victory, you might put them back up again, I don't know. Um, moving on, so cats and dogs, you know, the kitten that was stuck on the glue trap in the Scottish borders was one I found really distressing. As a fluffy little kitten um, who belonged to a family living next to a farm and he got stuck on the glue trap. Now this was horrific, uh, but you know, nothing was done of it. No, no prosecution or anyone was told that they shouldn't be doing this and it continued and they're, they're allowed to put them down. There's no monitoring system or way people can check or any controls to put in place to safeguard cats. And the last one, uh, last two, sorry, dogs and birds of prey. Well, dogs, I've, I've heard from people working in vets, dogs eating uh, poison bait, which has not been put out correctly. I've also heard of dogs eating and catching rats that they've caught, which have been poisoned. Now this is very common, uh, more common than I would like to um, actually have to say and, and, and says it goes on. And it's a really sad, really, really sad part of the pest control industry, which I don't think gets enough attention. 
the first story I heard of birds of prey dying through secondary poisoning um, was a case down in England. Um, this uh, client of mine had barn owls which visited their garden and they had rats which lived in their garden. Now this client's neighbour had poisoned the rats and the rats were dying on the lawn. Uh, they, you know, when they're suffering and dying, they kind of forget about everything they, a rat would do, stay in the cover and keep out of the way. So these rats are running across fields, they were trembling and dying and these barn owls were swooping in and picking these rats off and they were going back to feed their three chicks in the nest. Sadly, all three chicks died within a week of the poison being down and both the adults died in the coming weeks afterwards. Uh, we believe it was due to them eating the poison rats and ingesting the poison. Now I know the Barn Owl Trust um, are very aware of this and they campaign against rodenticide use, uh, but sadly, you know, th these are just the cases that we know about where birds of prey are dying, or the ones we know about where cats and dogs are, are falling ill due to, to poisoning. And these are the hidden victims of the pest control industry. And, and I just wish we could find a way to get some really good scientific data that we could put forward. So I think if we had a study, if we had data that we could put forward to the Scottish government, or even to the UK government and go, look, poison has to stop because these thousands of different species, non-target species are dying, now it's time for change. I'm hoping this day will come. Um, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Right, moving on. So how we help animals. So Humane Wildlife Solutions, we're very, very proud of our revolutionary approach to wildlife conflicts. Like I say, we'll never harm an, uh, an animal we work with. Our non-lethal service not only solves problems that harm a wildlife, but it also educates people along the way that there are alternatives in killing is no longer needed. So a really good example here. I I lose so much work because I will passionately describe to people the problem they're having. Um, and one of the things I like to do when I talk myself out of work, which a lot of people are going, well, that's a bit silly. You know, you've got to make a living. I do, but me making a living is not more important than an animal continue to be able to live. So educating people about the wildlife conflict they're seeing, and, and once they understand it, they use usually okay with it. And this can be from foxes in their garden, um, from rats living in the garden. You know, rats are part of our ecosystem. They do live in our gardens. They live around our houses. Rats live pretty much in every town and city and village across the country. And we need to accept that. And all I say for those situations is, as long as your home is safe, and, and you know, that's where I come in, into play. My expertise in protecting your home from animals getting in plays a really big part in this because then you can allow the rats to stay in your garden. Obviously, monitor the food access again because you don't have lots of them there, but they can be a part of your garden and you can enjoy them. Many, many people love having rats and watching them and, and seeing, seeing them in their little social groups and how intelligent they are and just, you know, being wild animals. But one of the things I like to do with all my jobs uh, is if I like to try and give people enough knowledge that they can self help themselves without me having to come out and charge people. So with every job I'll do this, and I'll be like, well, you can try this, you can try this, you can do this, and I recommend that. And if that means that someone can then go ahead and solve a wildlife problem without me needing to get involved, job done. You know, I'm not only just educated someone, I've helped animals from being persecuted or poisoned or killed. And if someone had to do that without having to pay any money, um, then fantastic. That works brilliant, brilliantly for me and is, to me, is always the best way forward. So how else do we help animals? We don't just help animals through our work that we, we do in the field, but we often donate uh, money to really good causes. So I do consultations, it can be just like this, I'm talking to you now, and I talk to people about their wildlife problems. And we donate 100% of our consultation fees to our chosen charity of the year. And the way I do this, even with the consultations, and people are ask, oh, how much do I need to pay? And I want to be accountable for the advice I'm giving. So what I'll usually say is to people, okay, the fee is £30, but I want you to pay what you think the service is worth. Uh, because I don't want people begrudging having to pay £30 for something they're not happy with. And if not happy, then I want them to tell me so I can 
make it, the service better. What I find though is some people pay above and beyond the £30 uh, and it's fantastic because what I like to do, I love to give that money back to different um, charities. So we've helped an animal hospice in the past. Um, we've helped equip a wildlife hospital, one that I played a part in, in work in, in the northeast of Scotland. Um, and, you know, we used our funds to, to buy them equipment that they needed in the hospital so they can do a better job helping animals. And I'm, I'm someone who, I'm not motivated by money and I love to give what I get back. So this is a way that I've been doing that. Um, we've even, um, through someone I met at a vegan festival who was running a stall, um, who are based in South Africa and they help vervet monkeys and they help other different monkeys who are being persecuted over there. So we've often seen one of their pleas for veterinary fees to adopt and um, pay for the care of the monkeys they have. Because again, charities rely on donations. So I've often done that too. So again, I like to give back. And at the moment, our current um, charity we're supporting, something very close to my heart, and a, a charity who support the work we do really, really uh, fantastically, and have done over the years, is the Fox Project. So at the moment, all our um, donations that we're getting through consultations are going directly to them, because they're a busy time of the year where they're helping loads of fox cubs. And as you can see, got fox here and a fox on the wall. I love foxes, my most favorite animal. Um, so if I can help other animals, even without me actually doing any work, to me, that is just fantastic. So it doesn't stop there. As well as this, I love doing research and trying to find new innovative ways of helping wildlife. So uh, changing the way that pest control are doing things at the moment, and then looking at it, assessing it, breaking it down and thinking, hang on a minute, if we did this, they wouldn't need to kill animals. One of my uh, research products I've done has been into moles. Now, I think moles are one of the most abundant mammal species in the UK. There is tens of millions of them. And you probably think, well, I've never seen a mole. <laughs> I don't really see many either, but apparently according to the records, there are tens of millions of moles in the country. So I wanted to find a way how we could stop moles. I tried live trapping, it doesn't work. I won't use kill trapping, I think it's cruel. So studying moles and read, reading research papers, reading as many books as I could get all about moles, I started to find ways of how far down they will go, you know, what kind of soils they like, when they're most active, um, times a day, funny enough, because moles like to be active in four hours periods of activity to sleep, activity to sleep. So I found a way, and we're trialing these at the moment. I've got a couple of clients who need help with moles at this moment. And we're trialing this new idea that we can mole proof an area, not just mole proof, but we can actually slowly edge moles out of an area where they're causing troubles. Now, it's not an instant solution. Sometimes wildlife conflicts are not just a click of a finger, job done. But I really do think um, the mole research I've done is a way forward for moles. And we've done wasp research too. Um, and this wasp research has seen us come up with a plant-based spray, which I thought was going to repel them from a nest. In fact, it turned out that this spray actually masked the pheromones they released to swarm. So they no longer swarmed. Uh, I took this research after someone heard about it to a big research company who offered me in the region of two and a half million pounds to develop it further. However, I had to turn them down because the research would involve extensive animal testing and it goes against everything I stand for uh, as a person and as a business. So I had to turn them down uh, and it was a hard decision to do uh, because this could have been a game changer for wasps and it still could be. Uh, now we're working with some universities seeing if we can take it further. Um, so these are kind of other things we do. So it's not all about me being in someone's house and stopping the mice getting in. You know, we support other wildlife organisations and also looking at how I can develop the way we work with wildlife on every aspect of every, every species. So the services that we provide to, to individuals and businesses have been everything from art centres, high street retailers, movie studios, and that's a good story. I'll just tell this really quickly. I did a movie studio where they were filming and the director would go and cut and he would go, Mouseman go and I'll do my work and he'll go mouse man cut 
and I'd have to stop my work and then he would go action and carry on the filming. So between the takes of them doing the filming, I would do my work around the, the set and this massive movie warehouse in, in this studio. And it was a, it was a fun job to do. Um, I've done jobs from restaurants, even the Glasgow Commonwealth Games. I worked at the Athletes uh, Village uh, with foxes and that was an incredible uh, job to do. Now I've done, you know, we do remote consultations, on-site assessments, exclusion, proofing, relocation. Now the relocation just mainly applies to wasps and bees um, because they're the ones that we focus mainly on the relocation. With other work, um, we find we don't need to relocate many animals. I also do educational talks, and a, a service that I never talk about is our cat service. I found a way, again, using completely plant based materials, how to stop cats fouling and digging and chasing off your birds in your garden. So, if you know, if you want to get in touch, you can ask questions about that service too. So, I'll move on. So, different species we cover. So here is just a few. So we cover rodents, birds, moles, insects, foxes, cats, and squirrels. But I'll tell you what, I add the breakdown of all the different jobs I've done. I have helped with over 59 different species of animals. And this is from badgers to cockroaches, cats to feral goats, moles to pine martins, possums, raccoons, and the best one all was had to be the wolves. So I had to help someone in Canada solve their wolf problem. It's completely bizarre, but it was absolutely incredible to do. And you know, with this work, I don't just work with such amazing species, but I've worked in over, you know, I've worked helping people in over 18 different countries from the United States to the Netherlands, Australia, Canada, the mountains in Nepal, Greece, and South Africa. So there is a, such a big need for the work I'm doing and it's so widespread. We've, we've gone international recently, you know, we've covered five different continents in the, in the planet now, um, which I think is quite incredible. Um, so we'll, we'll keep it going. So enough going on. If, if you didn't catch the wildlife quiz earlier, here is a reminder. This is your last chance to guess. Can you tell me what these four amazing creatures are? So I'm going to give you 10 seconds and then I'm going to reveal the answers. So if you can put your answers in the chat and we can see who got it right. So all these four species were photographed by myself in Scotland. And in fact, the little uh, orange haired dude in the bottom was actually the friend I was working at the Commonwealth Games with. And uh, we, shared, we shared some uh, lunch together, which I shouldn't have done, uh, but he was very, very nice. Okay, so here we go. I'm now going to reveal the answers. So here we go. So um, the top of the screen is a fox cub. Um, below that is a species which I absolutely love is a wasp. And then uh, this little moth, I'm really into my uh, moth recording lately. It's a new passion I've found. Uh, and this is a, a moth that um, a friend of mine found and let me photograph. It was a buff tip moth just the most incredible species i mean look at that camouflage it just looks like a twig um it's just the most incredible species and finally the adder at the bottom there another amazing uh, creature that i've actually worked with funny enough um and as you can see just look how incredible that is i mean who doesn't love scottish wildlife look at these four this is four of just thousands of incredible species so this is me about to wrap up now. I want to say congratulations to One Kind. Their campaigns and fighting for Scottish wildlife on so many different fronts. And two of the big ones that they did just last week uh, was their success of encouraging the Scottish government to add more protections to our native mountain hares and the seals. Now, I was dancing around this room here celebrating these successes uh, because the work One Kind does is just fantastic. I mean, seal shooting to be banned in Scotland and, you know, mass culling of mountain hares to be stopped. I know there's still work to be done on, on the mountain hare issue um, where they'll probably be able to kill them on the license. But what one kind done here is incredible. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that kind of work that one kind do needs supporting. 
So support one kind. With all the fantastic success one kind is having helping our wildlife, please let us, and that's me included, as well as you, do our bit by supporting their campaigns. And you know, you can do this by sharing their posts on their social media, by attending their events, signing the petitions, contacting your MPs when they say, we need your help to contact them. You know, it takes just a few minutes to do, and it has such huge ramifications because we're progressing forward with Scottish wildlife and one kind of driving this forward with other organisations too. And also help their campaigns and their investigations and donate to them where you can. I'm going to donate £50 um, to one kind as a thank you for allowing me to be on this uh, one kind fest um, to help with their, their campaigns. So if you can donate a little bit to help them too, please do, even the smallest amount. You know, three pounds is what someone will go out and spend on a coffee. So not many of us are going out getting coffees at the moment because most of the shops are still shut, but you get the gist of it. So, you know, we can together, all of you, one kind, ourselves, if we all come together, united, we can make this country a better place for our wildlife. We've got a long way to go, but I really truly believe if we work together, we can make it, uh, we, we, we can make it a better place. I did make this fantastic country even better for the fantastic wildlife we get to enjoy and see. If you don't want to start, uh, if you don't want to donate, start your own fundraiser. If you want to go and do the kilt walk or you want to do something else which help raise money, get your family and friends, your schools, your work colleagues involved. You know, every little bit counts. So please do your bit to help their fantastic work. So just a quick summary. If you have wildlife conflicts, remember, there is a kinder, more compassionate way of solving it and get in touch. I'm always available. I mean, sometimes it can take me a few days, maybe a week or so to apply, but I will reply because every email, every message, every voicemail, every tweet is important because if it involves helping an ant, a bee, a fox, a badger, I will be there to answer that, to try and help that animal. Because no matter what they're, whether they're, they're fleas or whether they're birds, the foxes, the badgers, they all deserve to have a compassionate way and deserve to go and live in their lives. Um, so I will always try and answer those calls. Don't get frustrated if I don't get you uh, straight away. I can go for a day and end up with nearly 20 voicemails and 30 messages and 40 emails and it's just me running this. So I always do my best to try and get through these. So what you do, if you, you, know, you want to help wildlife, share our posts, tell your friends and your family and your work colleagues and workplaces, you know, there is a better way. When you go to your work, ask them what they do for pest control and ask them why they chose a conventional lethal way, because there's a non-lethal way. And tell them about Humane Wildlife Solutions, get them to get in contact, 